This podcast is rated E for explicit and by category of true crime contains language and descriptions of crimes not suitable for young or sensitive listeners. The 1988 murder of Mary Plummer is nothing short of a travesty. Taken before her time, her family still suffers. In cold cases like these that are entirely solvable, justice is still to be served. This is why Mary, Part 4, Blame and Forgiveness. And you're listening to The Cold Case Chronicles. I know your secret. I know the truth. I know your secrets and I'm telling on you. Over the last four weeks, the Cold Case Chronicles have brought you the story of Mary Plummer, a young mother who was found shot to death less than a half a mile from her home. Not for a lack of suspects or motive, no one's been held accountable. The prime suspect may be long dead, but the preponderance of evidence suggests he likely did not act alone. We will forward our findings to the Hendricks County Prosecutor for further review. Last week we ended with Mike Burnett and his criminal history, but the police couldn't find enough evidence to connect him to the murder. So instead he was just charged with obstruction for lying about his whereabouts and providing those false alibis. Beverly told the investigators that after she broke things off with Mike, that he continued to give her money for the kids, which is nice, I guess. She also said that they would meet in out-of-the-way places because he said that his wife might have him followed for good reason. She said that he'd meet her in places like behind churches, at the skating rink, like we found out, and also at county road intersections. And when the investigator asked her to be specific about the intersections, she said that one of the intersections she would meet Mike at was 800 East and 200 South, which is Dan Jones Road. Wow. Right. The exact location that Mary was murdered. The officer asked her to ride with him and take him to the location, the exact location there. And Beverly took him to the spot, which was about 30 feet from where Mary was parked when she was murdered. Beverly said when she would park there at that intersection and wait for Mike Burnett, he would pull up behind her and exit his vehicle and come up to hers and talk to her, which seems very suspicious. But here's the thing. By the time Beverly made that statement to police, that location where Mary's car was found had been referenced in the Indy Star newspaper alone at least 24 times that I found. Wow. Damn. So it's easy to think that she may have just seen that in the Indy Star newspaper or seen it on the news. I don't know if it ran on the news. I'm sure it did. Maybe she made that part up. Right. We don't know. I started wondering why would she wait until March to make any kind of report to Crime Stoppers about her and Mike, why report him in March? From personal experience, just calling someone out that they're making me uncomfortable or like, I wish you wouldn't talk to me like that. Even though I've planned this like conversation in my head a million times, I'm not having this conversation the moment I feel like that. It's taken me quite a long while. So waiting to call Crime Stoppers doesn't set anything off for me. So you think maybe it just took her enough time to get up the courage to call crime yeah, stoppers? Yeah, because even that, like if I witnessed a crime and I was worried that they were gonna like retaliate against me, I'd still worry. Like, are they gonna? They're gonna know it's me, right? Right. Uh, how do I know it's anonymous? I'd go find the one payphone left in Indianapolis, <laughs> right. and like, and then use a pole to like dial a number so I don't touch right. anything. <laughs> right. Here's the thing about that though. On February fifteenth, which was just a few weeks prior to her making the Crime Stopper tip, there was an article in the paper stating that Mary's siblings were offering an additional ten thousand dollar reward on top of the thousand dollars from Crime Stoppers 
for any information that led to an arrest in Mary's murder. So that's also an incentive for her to come forward. And number one, it could have been an incentive for her to come forward and tell the information that she knew. Or number two, it could have been incentive for her to make up information and try to get the benefit of collecting the money. There's no way to know. It could have been strictly coincidental that the reward was posted and then it was just a few weeks later. I mean, the whole point of the reward being posted is to get people to come forward. Right. So, I mean, it worked. Yeah. I mean, I don't feel like it. she would have necessarily made it up just because of that. It could have been, I wasn't going to come forward because I was scared. But if I made money for it, then right. I, I'll come forward. So the question becomes... How then was he connected to Mary? Because even if they could prove that he did it, how was he connected to her? Yes, he was involved in some real estate. She started going to real estate school, but there was still no connection there. So according to the Indy Star, Mike Burnett was an acquaintance of Mary and her ex-husband, Joe. They met 10 years prior to the murder when Mike built their first home. Uh And his relationship continued with her ex-husband, Joe, when Mike did work for Joe's business. Okay. In fact, there was a check written to one of Mike's money funneling body shops for $2,800 the day before Mary's murder. Hmm. Now, the check was signed by Joe's business partner. And an employee from the body shop told police that the day after the murder, Mike Burnett and two owners of the body shop were talking and he overheard it. What they said was, quote, too bad about that plumber lady. And they started laughing, which isn't anything necessarily pointing fingers. I like, that yeah, points a finger, though. Too I don't know, bad. But 24 but, articles. Yeah, that's true. You know, too bad about her. Ha ha ha. Yeah, that's pretty shitty no matter how you look at it he also said about a week after the murder he was looking through the trash can for aluminum cans out back behind their shop Mm -hmm. and he did that regularly he found a handgun that had been burned behind the business did he turn it in no that's the thing he believed it had been burned in the wood burning stove that they had there in the business But the problem is he didn't go directly to the police. What happened is he was telling this story to someone at another business and they went to police. And so when by the time police questioned him about this and they found him and questioned him about it, his story remained the same. He said, yes, this happened. And yes, I did find a gun and it had been burned. Um, He told him what kind he said, you know, But there's no remnants of the gun left. The dumpsters, you know, everything's gone. The police asked the owners of the shop there about the $2,800 and said, you know, what's this for? Why did you get this money? And they were probably thinking like me, it might could have been a down payment on a hit for Mary. Well, both the owners were interviewed separately and they both initially denied having that conversation with Mike saying they never mentioned Mary's name. But when they were questioned more, they admitted that they sold a truck to Joe's business. They were joking, saying that they should probably go ahead and cash that check because Joe might have killed her and the police would probably be freezing his bank accounts and they wouldn't be able to get that check cashed. Hmm. Did they both come up with that story after they were both interviewed separately? (laughs) Yeah. I can, I don't know, you know, depending on what kind of person you are. I can see. I can see that being a legit thing, too. When questioned about the gun in the dumpster, adamantly denied ever even owning a gun in that business. They said they've never had a gun in the business. And then the investigator said, "Um, what about the bullet holes in the wall? (laughs) Because in the business, there were bullet holes in the wall. And it's kind of like asking an old single man with the ankle monitor why he has all these puppies and candy in his hand. You know, (laughs) it's like just stating the obvious here. There's bullet holes in the wall. And they were like, yeah, well, I did have a 22 pistol in the shop for a while. You know, so then it's like backpedaling on it. So 
you know, that tells you they're not completely honest. Right. Aside from all that, I did talk to someone who worked at Joe's business and they said that it's very likely it could have been a used truck that they purchased because they were always, they were really, you know, I I don't want to say like poor when it came to things with purchases, but they weren't able to buy new vehicles for projects and stuff. So they were always buying really cheap vehicles. And so it was very likely that they could have bought a used vehicle from them. But it, the coincidence of buying it the day before her murder was could have just been a coincidence. Right. Let's go back to Joe's alibi for a minute, though. So last week we discussed that his alibi was airtight. It, everything sounded really squeaky clean with him and his alibi. And sometimes I think there's a lot of things to be said about the details and how tight your alibi is. In fact, sometimes there's too many details whenever you give an alibi and I, I went think, pee at exactly 6 yes, p.m. <laughs> right exactly so if I was going to ask you what you did five days ago what would you tell me I if I was to look invest- at my calendar right okay even if you look at a calendar and I'd have I was to an investigator do the math to find out what was five days ago <laughs> right yeah that's me first of all what's today so Saturday mm-hmm. so what did you do on Saturday Oh, I went to Lowe's. Okay. And um, some other places. <laughs> I have no idea. I literally can't remember. But you're asking like the person with the worst memory. I woke up and it came on Caitlin's couch because a cat jumped on me. Then I went home at like 1025. And then it took me about 30 minutes to get home. And then when I got home, I laid in bed for about four hours. So that's more specific than I think I could be. Like, I honestly, like, on Saturdays, <laughs> I watch football all day long. And that's pretty much all I could tell you that I do on Saturdays. And if you think about it, if there was a trauma during that week as well, like Mary died two days after that day on that Tuesday that I'm talking about. So if I said, okay, tell me about your week, which is probably the way it went down. You know, Mm -hmm. tell me about your week this week because Mary died on Thursday. So just kind of tell me about your week. I can remember like traumatic days. I remember what I did, but days around it, I couldn't even tell you what year. Right. (laughs) But I can tell you exactly like I was at this store and this store and this store or wherever. I guess I go shopping a lot. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And then that happened. I could tell you Right. Like when my grandma, like Mm -hmm. when my grandmother died, I remember the store I was in in Alabama shopping when my mom called me and told me that she died. Like I know where I was, Right. you know, but anything, I couldn't have told you, I don't even know what year college I was in. Like I have no idea, but I could tell you where I was when I got that information. So on the Saturday after the Thursday of the murder. Okay, follow. Saturday after the Thursday, investigators asked Joe about his week. He said that on Tuesday, he picked up the kids at 4.30. He had been helping MJ sell candy for the school band. He wrote a check for $216 to the Avon school. Oddly specific. He had to check that checkbook. Yeah, probably. Back then. He then said he leaned on the hood of a car with the out-of-state plates, <laughs> which is the car that she was murdered in. There is in. no way you would put that detail in. Thank you. That's so silly. That's the first thing I thought. I was like, oh, what the actual shit? Like, That's like saying, yeah. oh, I touched Amy's bathroom door handle yes. around 7 p.m. tonight. Right. Um, so because I she was come. murdered in her bathroom, just know that my fingerprints yeah. will be on that door. I mean, I guess I get it. If you're like, if you're being questioned, you're probably automatically being defensive because yeah. you're being questioned. So there's right. obviously some kind of concern for you. Yeah. So I guess you're just wanting to cover all your bases. But also, <laughs> that's ridiculous. It is. is this, I don't know. It is. I'm trying no, to put I myself think so in that too. Shoe. I think because so too. If something were to happen to someone and I knew they died in their car and I was like talking to them through the window that day, I might mention it because... Yeah, you might. Because they're going to find you, and then they're going to say, "Well, why didn't you tell us that like, you were talking you through a window?" The car, whenever, you, so yeah, when we asked you, because you know you knew she died in her car. Yeah, so I get that also, but it's still silly. It's still it seems yeah. really silly. It does, unless you're like 
crazy about crime like us. And then That's true. you're thinking about things like that about, well, my fingerprints will be on the car. But I don't know. It just, it really stuck out. So that's hilarious. Though. Yeah. Just the way it sounds, not thinking it deeply. It is. It's just like, I leaned against the car. Yeah. <laughs> I can't and, even tell you what car right. we took to Lowe's. I leaned on the hood of the car with the out of state plate. <gasps> what? Oh my okay. Gosh. So then he says he left, went by the business, which he said the actual business, but I won't say it. That the one that Mike Burnett worked at, okay. that his wife owns. And he went to pick up some paperwork there. He went home to pick up his wife, Donna, and her two kids, and he went to the theater to see Cocktail. Oh, he took a, a six-year-old, an eight-year-old, a 12-year-old, a 13-year-old, and a 14-year-old to see Cocktail. I don't know what that is. Okay, the 80s were fucking stupid, though, because my aunt, I'm pretty sure, took me to see Birds. What is Cocktail? It's a Tom Cruise movie, and he's it's... He's, like, topless all the time and just... Shaking drinks, boobs. and... Yeah, it's... It what? just doesn't seem very kid-appropriate. That seems weird. Yeah. On Why a school night. Sh- <laughs> on a school night? <laughs> That's absurd. Yeah, right? He had a I mean, I'm not kids. mother of the year. Don't think that I am. I, my kids have seen stuff that they should not have seen, but it's just weird. Okay. So, he dropped them off at 9.30, and they went into their house, and then on Wednesday... He worked all day. He was really sick. He got home close to 430. Nothing unusual Wednesday night happened. He didn't talk about touching anybody's car or anything. Thursday night, he slept in until 830. Went home at four because he was sick. However, his brother gave a statement to police with a small contradiction to that. He said, Joe didn't go to work that day of the murder. Interesting. Yeah. Which... Do they work? How would he know? They work together and there's only like 35, 40 employees. But again, I talked to someone else that worked there and they said that his brother did kind of work at different houses. Yeah. So it's possible, even though they live next door to each other, it's possible that his brother left for work that morning and Joe was still at home because right. he didn't feel well and he left late. And then he came home and his car was there again because he came home early. So it is possible that they just didn't touch base that day. So he just thought that he stayed home. At 6 o'clock p.m., Donna brought me to Advil. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not making this up. I could not. At 6 p.m., Ronnie brought me a beer. <laughs> right? So my mom, if... Donna is anything like my mom. She will forget what time you can have your next dose of medicine and will literally write it down. Oh, okay. Just, okay. Just playing like extreme devil's advocate because no one else is like my mother. Donna is, but no one else is quite as dumb as my mother. I get it. Joe definitely wrote down the time. I need a devil's advocate here because trust me, he talked with someone on the phone at 630. At seven o'clock, Donna brought him Alka-Seltzer. 7.30 to 9 o'clock, he slept. 9.15 to 9.30, he called MJ. 10 o'clock, his brother and his sister-in-law came to the house to see wedding photos. 10.05 to 10.10, he yelled downstairs and told him to be quiet. Mm -hmm. Like, is that something, is that part of your statement that you yelled yelled downstairs and told him to be quiet? apparently. Then he asked for Advil. Donna came up and then asked his stepdaughter to bring up Advil. She brought up Advil and I thanked her. <laughs> what? This guy is like sweating. I know, right? Yeah. It's like, come on. Now, di- I would pee my pants. But, I would be so scared if I got But you know what? He did not say that the stepdaughter said you're welcome. So I'm really <laughs> upset about that. <laughs> like, <laughs> at 10.27, I grounded her for not right. saying you're welcome. <laughs> right. And then at 10.20... The brother and sister-in-law left. The stepdaughters went to bed and said goodnight. <laughs> I'm not making this up. Um, at 1030, I got up and I called my brother and he came over. Now, he has the flu. And just 25 minutes ago, I yelled at them for yes, talking. To, yeah. Th- see, that's a big difference because from the first time we were talking about it, I was thinking they came over like 6 p.m. ish. Mm-hmm. And that's when he was like, go away. I'm tired. <laughs> Yeah. And then like hours later, he was like, I'm starting to feel better. I took medicine. But it was 30 minutes later. Yeah. Which is kind of crazy. Right. To me. Right. So, well, no, they left at 1020 and he got up for him to come over at 1030. It was only 10 minutes. Like they left and then 
he gets up in 10 minutes and says, oh, okay, now I'm fine. Get Come on over. What do the kids say anymore? That's sus. Yeah, that's sus. <laughs> so sus. So from 1050 to 1055, his brother left. So he only stayed about 20 minutes. And then he says, I watched the news till 1130, took Alka-Seltzer and went to bed. Then MJ called around one and then he goes over and we know the rest of that okay. story. Now, here's Donna's account for the night because she was questioned. She says, I called his brother and sister-in-law at 930. They came over at 10 to look at the pictures. Um, Joe yelled for me to come upstairs at 1005. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> like, he asked for more Advil and for us to be quiet. I yelled down for him. He my- couldn't have more Advil until midnight. <laughs> So they were called exactly the same oh, thing. Oh, to at the exactly tea. the same time. To the T. That it, they did not coordinate that. Even I'm it, no, it gets even better. Listen. He asked for more Advil and told us to be quiet. I yelled down for my daughter to bring Advil and Joe said thanks. Shut up. I swear. They, there is this like, is in the report. That is just bad lying. <laughs> it is <laughs> it is bad when you if you're going to lie and get an alibi together, you can't be exact. Do you know what the problem is with that? Is it's not illegal to like tell the same story. Right. It's not. It's nothing's illegal about it. Only thing we can do about it is talk about is how talk suspicious shit about it, it is. Yeah. <laughs> right. And then at 1020, the brother and sister-in-law leave. I put the girls to bed. They said good night to Joe. I tucked them in and came downstairs. They're so polite. He says good night. <laughs> Apparently they do. Joe came downstairs at 1030 and called his brother. His brother came over, watched TV and news, went to bed at 1130, answered the phone after one, and Joe left to go over. The other thing is MJ, when she got home from school, it was 305 that day and her mom was home. So Mary was home when she got home. And what I don't understand is she came home with her report card that day and her mom was there until 4.30. They had plenty of time to talk about her report card, but her mom goes to work and then when she calls at 8.30, she asks about her report card to tell her, you know, she was proud about her report card and whatnot. So to me, she's definitely calling to set up the fact that I'm not coming home when I'm supposed to. Like in in Mary's mind, she knew I'm not coming home when I'm supposed to. I'm going to this place and I'm just kind of calling to get this my own little alibi, you know, because yeah. I'm sure they'd already talked about a report card. It's not that big of a deal. But when MJ gave her statement, she mentioned her dad, Joe calling, said he called, talked about my report card. And she also said that he spoke to her brother, Jake. Now, out of all those damn details, that Joe said about the ad bill, about the thanks, about the Good gratitude, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. You forgot one of your children. You forgot to say, oh, and I talked to Jake, which I thought was a little bit strange. What they talk about. Right. Who knows? But I thought that was a little weird that you left that out. You have no problem. You said you leaned what? against the car, but you couldn't remember you talked to someone. Yes. <laughs> Two years after the murder, Joe's business partner came forward to say that Joe approached him several times to inquire if he knew of anyone that would kill Mary. Excuse me. Yeah, but he was giving her half his salary, which amounted to about $15,000 a year. And he said, quote, I could afford to have her killed because of what I'm already having to pay her. And after one year, I would again show a profit. He said the last time he approached him about it was one week prior to her murder. Now, I tracked him down because he doesn't live in this area anymore. And he still backs that statement to this day. I don't know. He said, in fact, Joe asked him to borrow a gun. He wouldn't let anyone borrow a gun, let alone someone that was trying to have find someone to murder his ex-wife. When asked why he didn't come forward with that information sooner because he waited two years yeah. to come up, you know, say anything about it. He said that at the time they were business partners. They were still friends and they were business partners and it would have destroyed yeah. his business, too, because which, I'm, which makes sense. I mean, they were in it. He was 51 percent of the business and Joe was the 49. other 49. Good. Good math. Woo! And <laughs> So it makes sense 
that you wouldn't want your name drug through that as well. And then after the two years had passed, the business was splitting. He had nothing to lose. So he came yeah. out with the information. Yeah, my thing is people have done a lot worse for way less. So Right, right. Or you could look at it like the business is splitting. Did he come forward at that point and say these things just to drag him through the mud? Oh. Because why was the business splitting? They obviously were at odds or they wouldn't be splitting. So, again, you have to figure it out on your own. You know, really, do this many people, does this many people really have Stories that line. I mean, it's a lot of that, people all the just, stories line up, you know, too many coincidences. It is. It is. He also said that Joe had come into work the day of the murder and that he didn't act unusual. He didn't appear to be sick at all. Another thing that he said was that Joe borrowed a vehicle from him the day before the murder and the day after the murder, he returned it and it had been cleaned and detailed. <sighs> Nobody, mm -mm. no, right. You always hear stories about like that where someone has a car and they are caught cleaning it in the middle of like a rainy day or like November. <laughs> I don't know. And you know who always is the, the killer on Law and Order? That guy. That guy. <laughs> <laughs> to me, that's too many details. Like, okay. Why he, didn't he put that in his story? <laughs> he told us everything else, but he didn't say he borrowed a car and got it washed. I don't know. if If I was going to make something up about someone and try to frame them. I might say one of those things like, yeah, they asked me to kill, you know, to find someone to kill them or they asked me to borrow a gun or they borrowed my car and brought it back detailed. But dear Lord, all three of those things, it's like, come on, nobody is that stupid to do all three of those things. Right. It's just, I don't know. It's a lot. It's a lot. I spilled a gallon of milk in someone's car once and I didn't even get it detailed. <laughs> I just said, uh, so I bought you some Dawn because I spilled this gallon of milk in your car. <laughs> well, I try to think like it, even if he, I mean, borrowed I threw his up car. in my car and I didn't even get it detailed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in the and car. And that was like, like a couple on of months the ago. steering wheel. <laughs> yeah. Even if he borrowed the car, let's just say allegedly he borrowed the car to do the murder how could he have done it he would have had to be upstairs pretending to be sick but actually not be upstairs we can't say that he didn't do that you can easily even sitting here i could say with morgan downstairs i could say oh morgan just said be quiet we need to keep it down if you were a child well, if you were a child and then you got questioned the next day and they said, so do you remember from that night? And then you could say, yeah, well, my dad told us to be quiet. And you're just assuming that they were down there. Mm -hmm. It's that power suggestion. It is possible that something like that could have happened. I'm just Boom. I'm not saying it's probable. I'm just saying <laughs> it's possible. It is. Again, though, his brother and his sister-in-law would have had to been on it, too, because they lived far enough away that it would have been a good 45 minutes hour round trip drive. And if they actually came over at 1030, if his brother came out, well, not his sister-in-law, but just his brother came over at 1030 to see him. Then the murder happened in that window and he would have needed to be back home to see his brother at 10 30 so that's the only piece of that puzzle that doesn't fit because as we've mentioned it's a little weird that at like 10 o'clock he's asking them to be quiet and then 25 minutes later he's yeah inviting them back over yeah there there's a lot of weirdness going on one thing that stuck out was joe's reluctance to take a polygraph he first argued the reliability of the test, which I get. We've talked about in other podcasts before. I'm not sold on the reliability of the test either, especially in the 80s. However, he asked what the questions would be on the polygraph. And they told him there would be two questions. One would be, did you shoot Mary Plummer? The second question would be, did you cause the death of Mary Plummer? 
and the definition of cause was described to him. He said he would think about taking the test, but only on the provision that he would be required to only answer question number one, and he would not answer question number two. And they said, okay, you know, can you elaborate a little bit on this? And he said that he felt if he had not divorced Mary, then she may not have been at that location at the time of her death. So he couldn't necessarily say that the question of did you cause the death because she wouldn't have been at work because she was a stay-at-home mom. So he couldn't say exactly that he didn't cause it because his cheating kind of caused it. Why would the investigators not rephrase the question? Thank you. Why not Why, change Are it you to, directly involved or do you know? Do you know who shot Mary Plummer? Yeah. that That's all you have to do. Do yeah, you know that's who a shot clear her? yes or no answer. Yes. And then if you won't and it answer has that thing about you being feeling guilty for no. sleeping around. Right. And then four days later, he contacted the investigator and just refused to take the test at all. He said, no, I'm just not going to take it. But yet yeah, that to me, that's on the investigator. The investigator should have rephrased that because I, I do get that. Like you because I'm one of those people that try reads between the lines of everything. I would be trying to pick that apart as well. Did you cause, but ask it a different way or don't answer it yes or no. Just say, no, I didn't shoot her or I didn't cause her specifically to be shot. No one I know shot her that I know of, but you know, I mean. Oh, so many different rephrasings of that yeah. question. I also spoke with a very trustworthy source who is close to Mary, one of the closest people to her. And she said that Mary confided in her just before her murder. Within the week, she told her that Joe had felt bad for the divorce. He wanted to make things right with her. And Mary was super excited about it. And Joe wanted to make it right by giving her a lump sum of money. She didn't feel right about it. She told Mary, she was like, something just is not sitting well with me. You don't need to do this. I don't know what's happening, but I don't trust it. You don't need to meet with him because they always fought about money. So why all of a sudden is he wanting to give you a lump sum of money because he feels guilty? Like something just isn't sitting right. But Mary was excited about it. She was just like, don't do it. It just something's not sitting right. Don't do it. According to her, Mary and Donna did not get along at all. In fact, Donna was extremely catty. She would do things that I can't even imagine being a grown ass woman. It's so Karen. Like, I can't even. This is an example. When Donna first was with Joe, she wrote a letter to Mary and said, remember that concert that Joe took you to and you were so excited about? Well, guess what? I was sitting on the other side of Joe through that whole concert. I mean, this is a grown woman that has three kids Who and won, she has two kids. And one, the, the guy. Yeah. Good luck with you. Yeah, look what you got. Good riddance. I hope the door hits your fucking fat ass on your way out. Wait. Also, where did you get those wide cap boots? I love them. <laughs> well, my thing is, <laughs> if this was my life, we'd be doing this podcast about Donna. Because I'm going to tell you what, if somebody tried to pull some shit like that with my husband, mm, it it would not go well for her. I would tell you that right now. And I'll tell you that, Ronnie Seabird, listen up. So you better not have that bitch on the other <laughs> side of you. <laughs> that be, I'm telling you, she next, better be at least three rows away. Yeah, that next time we go to a concert, I don't care who it is, there better be a guy sitting next to you because I'll whoop her ass. <laughs> <laughs> so Donna wasn't crazy about Mary getting any of Joe's money. She was just catty. But again, there was no financial gain for her murder. The life insurance policy went to Mary's siblings. And that was for the kids, but it was in care of... Did she know that? I don't know. 
but Joe was no longer going to be paying child support. So there was a little bit of financial gain for them. However, they also were gaining full-time custody of three kids. And I'm sure Joe would love that. But as a stepmom who obviously has a chip on her shoulder, did she really want three kids joining the family full-time? That's a lot. I mean, I, I know what it's like. You know, I had... I have a stepson too. And believe me, I love her to death now, but his mom at the beginning, it was no fun day in the park. Like we did not get along at all. Now we're friends at the beginning. It's not easy. It's not easy at all. Another source said Mary told a coworker the night of her murder at Lazarus that if all things went as planned, She was going to be coming into a lot of money that night. But would you say that to a coworker? Somebody that you've been working with for two two days? Two days? Yeah. Plus, it's retail. Do you, You don't even work with the same people most of the time, two nights in a row. And why would you tell a total stranger that you were about to come into a lot of money. She was going to buy something. <laughs> I'll buy that later when I come into all this money. That's true. She might say, oh, yeah, I might buy that. I'm about to come into a lot of money. I mean, who knows? After Mike's name came out in the paper as being the only suspect in Mary's murder, her ex-husband, Joe, continued to do business with him. And that's very telling to me because I get the whole, you know, you're innocent until proven guilty thing. But come on, if the mother of your children's only suspect to her murder is, even if he is just a suspect, I don't think I would continue doing business with this person. No shit. Yeah, it just looks bad for you. Mike Burnett died in 1995. He had cardiorespiratory arrest due to chronic alcohol abuse. The alibi told me he covered his alcoholism well, but he carried around a large bottle of gold Listerine and swished it religiously. And that's how he covered up his vodka. Alcohol with alcohol. Well... It sounds brilliant. I haven't gotten that bad, but it's good to know. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. Gold listerine, that's savage. That's the grossest. Yeah, that is savage. And years later, she realized that it was to get rid of the vodka smell, and it was always in his vehicle. Beside the listerine in his vehicle was always his handgun. And that handgun was the exact same type of firearm that the employee described as being burned in the dumpster behind the shop that Mike was running money through. Also, it was the same type of firearm that shot three bullets into Mary Plummer. There are a lot of unknowns in Mary's case, and I truly believe that there are people still alive today that know exactly what happened and they need to be held accountable but it's not all about accountability it's also about forgiveness to her children mary's three children have grown into amazing successful adults despite the tragedy that they went through they've spent years picking up the pieces of their lives their family the fear of the unknown assailant not knowing if it was someone in their family, someone that lived in their neighborhood. It's about finding peace for them and knowing what happened to their mom and being able to forgive them and let go and close that chapter. Forgiveness involves taking all those negative emotions, replacing it with the positive attitudes. And it's not easy and it's not something easy for them to do. And it's very hard for people to forgive. Mary's family would never condone the behavior that occurred that Thursday night in November of 1988, but forgiveness is about extending mercy to those who harm us, even if they don't deserve it. So many people live on the theory that misery loves company, and instead of forgiving those who are guilty of crimes, they instead refeed their egos with more resentment and choose to blame their misery on someone. It continues to cycle and breed more death and resentment if people resist forgiveness. 
Cases like Mary's weigh heavily on the crew. It's hard not to become personally invested in these cases as victims' families become close. Between our own lives and careers and children, we have decided to take a break. Amy will be dedicating her time to a couple of previous cases lobbying for prosecution. We thank you all for listening and hope to return after the holidays with a new vigor and more updates. We ask that you keep Mary's case close to your heart and say a prayer or have a moment of silence as the 32nd anniversary of her loss occurs this Tuesday, November 17th. We want to thank you for listening for the past 18 months and we hope to see you soon. Please follow along on social media for updates of our return. And as always, have the day you deserve, especially if you're responsible for the death of Mary Plummer. I know your secrets and I'm telling on you.